Order. Roll call, please. Hey Wilson. Here. Tweed Schumann. Here. Marshall Savitsky. Here. Chuck Van Etten. Here. Jeff Haney. Here. Bill Trepanier. Here. Don Pettit. Don, can you hear us? Carol Pearson is excused. Sabrina Dunlap. You have a quorum. Thank you. Don's trying to get back in again. Let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. May I have certification of uh, the open meeting slot, please? This meeting has been noticed to the public and news media as required by section 19.84 of the Wisconsin statute. Thank you. An agenda has been set. Uh, we can now take public comments on anything that is not on the agenda. All right, no comments for Number six, number seven, uh, may I have a motion to go into um, public hearing, please? I'll make that motion. I'll second it. A motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. All right. So we are now in public hearing for the public, for the tourist rooming house ordinance. Um, I'd like to invite Ginny Chabek uh, to give some information. She was the chair of the ad hoc committee. Good evening, and thank you to the committee for giving me time to speak today. My name is Ginny Chabek, and I served as the chairperson of the ad hoc committee that provided guidance toward the creation of this ordinance. The committee was tasked by the county board to make recommendations for an ordinance to regulate short-term rentals. This was the second attempt to put regulations in place. The first was in 2017, when an ordinance was drafted by an ad hoc committee and initially approved by county board, only to subsequently be repealed due to legal pressure. The ordinance that we are discussing today was not written by the ad hoc committee. It came together based on a couple of other communities' ordinances, the input of county employees who were tasked to manage short-term rentals, and Rebecca Roker, legal counsel for the county. Employees of the county were clear about what they needed to be successful going forward. Tools. Tools to provide some answers to the community that they didn't have in the past. The most important tool that this ordinance provides is occupancy based on state statutes that define the capacity of the septic system. If the property happens to be serviced by a municipal wastewater treatment system, then occupancy is based on other state statutes that consider things like the size of the rooms. For most of our county, properties are serviced by POUTs, private on-site wastewater treatment systems. County sanitary permits include data that the sanitarian uses to determine the maximum occupancy in order to comply with these state statutes. The county is obligated to follow these state statutes. The health of our community, our groundwater, and our environment depends on it. Septic systems are rated based on peak capacity, not average. You may hear that this isn't fair to the rental business. Consider that rental businesses are operating in residential neighborhoods utilizing our limited infrastructure for the purpose of making a profit. Yes, there are benefits to the community due to these businesses. Owners have a right to rent their properties. The high dollars that are associated with short-term rentals are relative to how many heads you can put in beds. And imagine the potential impact of putting 15, 18, or more people in a house with a septic system designed for six. The ad hoc committee was careful not to overregulate behavior. Certainly, other issues were addressed in the document as they were also causing problems. If there was an existing law that addressed an issue such as noise, the committee chose to lean on education. 
property owners and managers will have access to that kind of information on the county website. Property owners are encouraged to provide that information to their renters, including any specific information about the lake or the area where the property is located. Neighbors will have information on who to contact and how to do so in the event of a problem. Regulate, educate, and enforce. These are the elements that will provide the change that is needed in order to maintain the health and safety of our neighborhoods. Most importantly, the fresh clean water that brings visitors here will be protected as the state intended by establishing the statutes that all Wisconsinites must respect. Let's not wait for algae blooms, fish kills, or septic pools to form in our backyards. I encourage the HHS committee to approve the TRH ordinance today. Thank you. Thank you. We have a number of people that would like to speak to this um, ordinance and uh, in no particular order, I will ask Terry Hogan to come forward. And we will um, accept uh, your comments for approximately three minutes. All right, thank you. And thank you for listening to my comments. I live at 9324 Secluded Trail. I believe VRBO should be highly regulated. There's no other business that you can set up in a residential area and take a residential area and turn it into a resort. Um, I believe that the draft ordinance is a good start, but I actually believe that it should be stronger than what's actually drafted. Um, I think it should limit the number of days. Um, I think it also, um, the, the 9357 and 9341 secluded trail were purchased for the exclusive use of renting them short term. The owners, Eric and Amy Dusnowski, are from Ellsworth and I have never lived there. Uh, there have been multiple parking issues and noise issues. I feel there should also be a special zoning because this is a business. This is not a residential house anymore. It is now a, a resort. Uh, I believe neighbors should be able to have input into the licensing of the VRBOs. Just recently, we had another parking issue with cars parked on both sides of the driveway, blocking driveway access um, at this place. I called the owners, Eric. They promised me to have it resolved. It didn't get resolved all weekend long. I believe this is a good start. I think it should be passed, but I think we should continue and be stronger on, on creating businesses in residential areas. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Next is Doug Kurzweil. Douglas Kurzweil, 11055W Arrow Road, Hayward, Wisconsin, 54843. Uh, public hearing, is this sworn or no? I don't know what you mean. Oh, sworn testimony. Under oath? Well, I'm not going to say anything different. I'd say the same. All right. Uh, Jenny and the committee... They've made a great first step, sizing occupancy according to design standards of the septic systems. What a lot of people don't realize is the septic system of pouts can be overwhelmed with a single four, five, six inch rainfall. It'll overwhelm the system. And uh, if you don't believe it, ask some folks up in Bayfield County, they've had three of them in the last 10 years. So uh, off to a great start, but I haven't seen anything in the record that I've read. And again, I, I, I volunteered to serve on this committee when it was announced at a zoning committee meeting a year or so ago. And I asked uh, the county board chair at the time, uh, Mr. Schumann, uh, if I could serve on the committee and he referred me to the zoning administrator. And I asked him face, face to face, I believe you saw, you witnessed that tweet. And uh, I offered my services and, and, and uh, I, haven't, I haven't gotten an answer yet. Now, some people will say that due to uh, my service for going on 44 years in rural municipalities in Sawyer County, and based on what uh, veteran realtors and veteran appraisers have told me and comments from 
people from the Department of Revenue that I probably know more about residential real estate situations and values in Sawyer County, in rural Sawyer County, rural Sawyer County, probably than anybody alive today. Rural residential property in Surrey County makes up 87%, according to DOR and county uh, data, 87% of your tax base. RR1 makes up over 60% of the total tax base of Sawyer County. And Mr. Hogan, uh, with his comments about commercializing the residential neighborhoods, uh, is really spot on. Now, again, this ordinance, with the, with the capacity, uh, uh, number of people, and everything based on uh, the, the capacity of the septics, spot on. However, there's a couple of things allowed in the statutes that I can find nothing in the record. And again, I, I haven't listened to all the tapes of the ad hoc committee meetings. I don't have the time to do that. I'm still working. But reading in the paper and so forth, there are other things in the right to rent law which is part of a budget uh, bill from seven or eight years ago. It allows the municipality, in this case, the county, because it'd be a county ordinance, to limit the terms of these rentals to a minimum, a minimum of 180 days per year. And over a year ago, I suggested to uh, Zoning Administrator Koslowski that uh, it would almost be the wisdom of Solomon to take that option. Let these people rent for 180 days a year and let the people who live there in a quiet, peaceful, up north neighborhood, 185, well, this year it would be 186. Heck, I'd even go 182, 183, one way or the other, where it can be a residential neighborhood. Okay, so that's one, and this, I don't, I don't see where this has even been considered, much less discussed, or why it would have been dismissed by the ad hoc committee. And- Doug, can you close? Oh, uh, I'm gonna try real quickly. Okay, and then the enforcement. Uh, there's 13 blanks in the proposed draft ordinance. I wouldn't sign a document of any kind, a contract or a check with one blank, much less 13. And then also enforcement, which uh, has been a problem with a lot of things in the county. And the way this looks like, it is basically sanctioning neighborhood committees of vigilance to enforce violations of the short-term rental ordinance. And I don't know what kind of liability that might expose the county to, but perhaps Ms. Roker would like to respond to that. But I know in my own situation where I've had problems with this because of uh, three years of illegal operation of a multi-unit situation, it follows the old Roman Empire's adage of divide and conquer. Thank you, and Doug. This will divide the neighborhoods and turn it into ruling rather than governing. Thank you. And thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next would be Matt Dale. My name is uh, Matt Dale and I own the largest property management company in the area, representing about 45 different vacation rentals. I was a member of the ad hoc committee that created this ordinance until I came to the conclusion that the committee was stacked with anti-vacation rental representatives with an agenda to simply suppress the industry. Mostly the same individuals tried to do the same thing a few years ago and the county board realized this absurdity and voted it down. There are two issues that I am concerned with regarding this ordinance. The first is the occupancy restriction of two people per bedroom. This regulation has a direct impact on my company's income. We stand to lose tens of thousands of dollars per year because of this and hundreds of thousands in the long term. Keep in mind that there is no grandfather clause and rentals that have been operating for decades with their current occupancies will now be forced to reduce them and lower their rental rates, 
resulting in less competitive rates compared to other vacation rental destinations. The committee is using the possibility of overworked septic systems as justification to restrict the occupancy. However, the zoning department could not even produce one case of a failed septic system at a vacation rental. There is no justification to restrict occupancy. Also, this regulation is an unequal application of the law, which is forbidden by our U.S. and Wisconsin constitutions. Wisconsin Administrative Codes, SPS 382 and 383, which is being applied to vacation rentals in this ordinance, applies to every residence. It has not been enforced on any properties regarding the occupancy restriction. Now we have the regulation being enforced on properties on the basis that they rent short term, which is discrimination and an unequal application of the law. The second issue that I have with this ordinance seeks to make cabin owners responsible for the conduct of their renters. There are no instances or considerations given with this regulation, leaving it entirely open-ended. This goes against the general rule of law and should only be applied under specific circumstances like negligence or prior knowledge of criminal intent. As it stands, the cabin owner could be fined if the renter breaks any law, causes any damage, or violates the rights of another. Our community has spent decades trying to grow the tourism industry in our area, which has had a tremendous financial impact on nearly all area businesses. The vacation rental industry has driven this growth. Now we have our local government working to suppress what we have worked so hard to accomplish. Please vote no on the acceptance of this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, next would be Leona Sedlacek. Thank you. Uh, that's my name, Leona Sedlacek. I'm a resident of Sawyer County. Um, I brought uh, a handout that I'll leave with you today. The Wisconsin Department of Tourism released its 2023 report uh, with some specific county breakdown of tourism data that I think you will find interesting. For Sawyer County, the economic impact of tourism dollars in 2023 was $150 million. Direct visitor spending was $110.1 million. This employment that was created was 948 jobs. The labor income, so people got paid and then they spent money in the community, was another 33.9 million, which was spent over and over again to support businesses and members of our community. This past winter was a harsh example of what happens to our local economy without tourists with some businesses reporting a 75% decrease in revenue. We were definitely impacted with having only a handful of rentals over the whole winter. Short-term rentals are in a unique position to help accommodate this ebb and flow of few or maximum tourists. And the report here talks about short-term rentals being preferred because of the comforts and conveniences that they provide. This ordinance runs the risk of having a significant impact on the county budget. The tourism report states that without tourism, each household would have to pay an additional $666 annually in taxes to keep county income at the same level. So if we do the math, Sawyer County has 8,210 households. Because of the tourism, the county brings in $5,418,600. So it's difficult to predict what the full economic impact of this ordinance would be. In our case, we have a one bedroom cabin. A family of four would not be able to stay with us. Do they have the resources to rent a two bedroom lodge? Do they shorten their vacation or do they stay home? So we don't know. Short term rentals are not the only lodging options, so the impact of a decrease of our segment of the lodging industry may not be known for a while. Some may close, 
Others will suffer decreased bookings, and along with that, will be paying less salaries to all the contract workers that support the rentals, cleaning services. Let's assume that this ordinance results in a conservative estimate of a 20% decrease in county lodging. <laughs> if you do the math, that will create a decrease to the county budget of $1,083,720. The county budget, I understand, is in the neighborhood of $31 million. So this one ordinance could potentially decrease county revenue by 3.5%. How are we gonna make that up? Are we going to increase taxes on the residents? Will we cut services? I think those are things that, in addition to all the other issues that people will bring before you tonight, needs to be considered. Although much effort was put into writing an ordinance that would be legally enforceable, it lacks common sense, and it will be detrimental to our economy. I urge you not to pass this ordinance. And I'll give you. Our next speaker would be Terrence Dahman. <laughs> Hello, I'm Terrence Adaman, uh, 13989 Northern Lights Road. Um, forgive me for being nervous, I'm not a public speaker. Um, my wife and I retired four years ago from the lacrosse area and moved to this area because we love it up here. We refurbished a small one bedroom log cabin and turned it into a vacation rental. And it did pretty well for a couple of years. Uh, last winter was terrible, as you might have known. Um, but I'm definitely opposed to this ordinance. There is a couple of vacation rentals I understand that are problem childs that have parties or whatever disruptive to the neighborhood. And I'm not sure why they haven't been addressed as opposed to a shotgun effect that affects a raw law that affects everyone. Uh, we run a nice little vacation rental. We have had no police presence ever, no, no, uh, no complaints from neighbors. In fact, if we're out of town, the neighbors will help with snow removal. Uh, we have a good relationship that way. But uh, some of the ordinance, the way it's written, many of our, because we're one bedroom, many of our rentals are mom and dad and a couple of children. And because we're one bedroom, we would not be allowed to do that because with one bedroom, you're restricted to two people even if you're only using that septic system for a couple of days during the week and the rest of the time it's, it's empty. So there's that septic system is definitely not overtaxed at that point. Um, if you have a little party, grandma's birthday party and four or five people show up, we're in violation at that point because we have too many people there and not all of them would stay. But um, so it, it just seems that I know there's issues with a couple of short-term rentals and I wish that they would have been addressed individually and not a law that affects everyone. Um, I can see some of these short-term rentals giving up the ghost and not doing short-term rentals anymore because of it. And um, be careful what you wish for because they could easily turn into long-term rentals. And then you may have the family from hell living next to you forever as you know with uh, parties and abandoned vehicles or whatever and there would be no restriction on that so um i think short-term rentals are, are here to stay they're they they definitely bring economic uh, assistance to the community um i think they're a, a needed a needed feature and i'm definitely opposed to the ordinance thank you Our next speaker would be Ben Wellneck. Uh, ben Wellneck, 16815 West County Hill Road. Um, been a resident in Hayward, I think, almost eight years now. Um, I am a short term rental owner, kind of stumbled into it over the last six years. Um, have two little kids in the school district. Uh, wife works here, and um, 
from the ordinance perspective, first off, I would I would encourage you to vote no based on what the ordinance, the proposed ordinance coming to your desks is based on not even the fact, I'm not going to get emotional with it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to sell you on that. We're saving the lakes because it's clear that we don't care about that. If we have houses around a lake, eventually it's going to, it's going to have some impact. We lot of boats. We can't, we can't go on that. Um, however, what I do encourage, you know, from my household, from my business perspective, I own businesses over the years. I've owned long-term rentals. I've owned short-term rentals. I've worked in public accounting for many years. I've had many backgrounds. I've lived in many areas throughout the country. And what I would encourage you in any plan is to take data. That would include uh, heat maps of problems, um, uh, lists of problems, lists of issues, lists of things that works. Um, problem areas, whether it's uh, a certain area or certain houses, um, management companies, how many they rent, how many problems they have, what they're, what works good, what doesn't work good, all that data, take that, compile it, which we haven't done based on discussion from the ad hoc committee that was voluntarily discussed that there was no way to track all of this data because there was too much to do it and there was no process. So usually you would take a pile of data, Come up with your goals, which you have a list of goals in the ordinance. However, with that, you would come up with metrics on how to measure that. So without having data and using outliers as examples to come up with a plan with no metrics and with intended goals with no metrics, what's going to happen is we're going to be back here in seven years, like we were here 2004, 2024 from 2017. We're going to be back here in seven years trying to propose eight more rules based on I thinks rather than data and information and experience from several different um, property management owners to, dic to, to offer up how far does it make sense to have a, a representative from? Does it make sense to have 30 miles? Does it make sense to have 60 miles? Does it make sense? To there was a, a one hour conversation, 45 minutes, I might be exaggerating, 30 minute conversation of how, what the distance is for property owners to have representative. It was all, I think this, I think that, rather than having a pool of uh, management owners, whatever it is to say, Hey, this is our best case. This is our best practice. So without a pile of data and metrics and how we're going to measure it, it's impossible to know what's works and what doesn't. So I don't want to be back here in, tw in 2029 at 50 years old complaining that, Hey, this didn't work. And now we have eight more rules on top of the five more rules that we put in place. So I would encourage you to vote no on this and go back and gather that data, ask those questions, come up with some metrics and how we're going to, none of us are going to argue. I'm just going to Matt because he owns 40, they, they manage 45 places. None of us are going to argue that there's bad ones that we need to fight. We need to come up with good, good best practices for all of us to follow. I, I, I do very well with our places as far as, you know, managing it, being a good neighbor, doing the best I can. And I, I would think that 90% are. So without those in place, I, I, I just don't want to be here back here in several years, having the same discussion with eight more rules in place. Thank you, Ben. So, thank you. Uh, do we have anyone online? Yes, Matt has his hand up and then I would like to speak after Matt. Hi, thank you. My name is Matt Gotham. I own property uh, on, in the town of Lenroot. Um, we short-term rent our our house, um, and I've got a number of concerns about this ordinance. Um, mostly that it seems there's a, a small number of short-term rentals in the county that are causing problems um, that could be solved by enforcing existing state statute. I don't know why we need to add um, additional ordinances when you've already got laws on the books that just need to be enforced. Um, also, um, there's a number of specific things in the ordinance that are very concerning. Um, first with privacy, um, the ordinance would give the the county to inspect uh 
a TRH, a, a short-term rental, at any time, at any reasonable hour, um, when renters are there, uh, when normally a uh, warrant would be required to enter that property. Um, if somebody rented their house for one week during the Berkey and needed, so needed to get a TRH license per the ordinance, the County health inspector could go into that property at any time during the entire year, even if those owners are occupying the, their own house. Um, the, the septic system requirements that are, that you're using to limit, uh, occupancy, um, don't seem to make sense. It seems that you're really, the ordinance is really trying to get to a two person per bedroom occupancy and is using, uh, this reason or that reason, septic or anything else to try to meet that requirement instead of just using common sense, uh, rules that are again, already in state statute to look at what occupancy could be. Um, I encourage you to vote no on this. Uh, there's just, there's a lot in the proposed ordinance that, again, is already in statute um, that is really concerning from privacy laws, from private property right laws, um, you know, neighbors, giving neighbors almost unlimited control to shut down a short-term rental, um, just even if they're just a disgruntled neighbor and don't like the fact that the rental is there, whether or not anybody's doing anything wrong. So I appreciate, I appreciate your time. Um, and, and I'll uh, let you move on. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And your wife wanted to speak? No, this uh, no, the, I, I cover it for both of us. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> And my apologies, I don't know how to raise my hand on here. <laughs> so is it okay if I, if I go ahead? Who are you? Amy Stalter. And is it okay if I move forward? Yes, if you give your name again and address, please. Sure. Amy Stalter. And we own three uh, vacation rentals in Sawyer County. Um, one is on Moose Lake in the Hayward area, and the other two are in Birchwood. And I just want to make sure that everyone is aware that we are regulated. Um, it, someone made it sound as though we're just out here putting a for rent on our door and going at it. But in fact, um, we pay a license. We have an annual water test. Um, we have inspections. And we pay, uh, we pay actually a room tax to the township, we pay a room tax to the county, and we pay a room tax to the state, along with property taxes and um, all the other taxes that a regular homeowner would pay. And I was, I was not on the committee, although I was very involved in watching all of the and being represented in the ad hoc committee meetings. One of the first meetings um, struck me as, as quite odd when someone on the committee commented that this is a back door to restricting and limiting the number of people who can stay at short-term rentals. So as was mentioned before, there really hasn't been any data brought forth as to there's hasn't been any water pollution information. There are no septic pools forming. There have been no septic failures. None of this could be documented or data shown for the purpose of limiting the number of people because of septic systems or pollution. And so it just seemed as though the committee was not being representative of everyone in the county, but in fact was instead against short-term rentals, which I tried to understand again and again, but I couldn't just because of, you know, the benefit that we bring to Sawyer County as a vacation rental, the tourism, the higher additional taxes, 
um, the additional service dollars and the additional, um, you know, monies into the area. Um, I would encourage you all to vote no for this because as was indicated before, nothing is relying on solid data and there seems to be quite a bit of overreach. A lot of the items that are left blank on your copy seem to be things that, you know, may not be legal or is maybe already covered elsewhere. It just, it feels like we're being imposed on and just there's overreach from a county perspective. And as far as we're concerned, if something like this were to go through, and this will be my last comment, we'll probably 1031 exchange our properties and move to a county that is more um, short-term rental friendly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amy. Do we have any uh, correspondence that you would like to read? We have one because the other one already spoke personally. So okay. this one is from Cheryl Treland, president of the LCFRA. As president of the Lake Chippewa Flowage Resort Association, we would like to go on record as being in favor of a short-term rentals in Sawyer County. We realize there are problems associated with STRs, but the economy of the area needs the additional lodging and types of facilities that are available through STRs. We understand that some are located in residential neighborhoods, that there are problems with noise, parking, and overcapacity use of some facilities. But overall, the homes managed by local property management companies do a good job with handful of STRs that seem to be repeat offenders, usually not with local property management companies. We hope any ordinance put forward by Sawyer County does not discriminate against STRs, but rather that the ordinance improves STRs in Sawyer County for the good of all owners of STRs, neighbors of STRs, and competitors of STRs. That's it. Thank you. And there was one other email, Andy. Yes, we have an email from Linda Zomer, Sawyer County Health and Human Services Board. This email serves as testimony for the June 11, 2024 public hearing on the proposed county TRH licensing ordinance. Number one, the county should propose postpone acting on county licensing ordinance pending ATCP 72 administrative rule revisions. The proposed changes can be found here. And, uh, the committee has a, a link in the email they received. The county would likely need to significantly amend a county licensing ordinance to be consistent with new state rules. The current draft licensing ordinance includes zoning definitions that will be changing. The last meeting of the ATCP 72 advisory committee will be at the end of this month, so the final proposed language will be available shortly. Number two, Surrey County should also wait until the Wisconsin Counties Association provides a final county model ordinance before adopting one based on the limitations of Surrey County. Three, the county need not adopt a zoning ordinance amendment nor a licensing ordinance to establish TRH capacity according to POTS capacity per DSPS rules. Four, the county should pursue zoning ordinance amendments to require a conditional use or special use permit that requires a public hearing due to the change in the use of the property and structures from a primary residential use to a transient non-resident use. A conditional use permit is required for more than one dwelling used as a short-term rental, a resort, so it would be consistent to do the same for one short-term rental. Five, should the county adopt a licensing ordinance or amend the zoning ordinance, the following requirements should be included. A, provide a copy of the fire inspection reports, B, signage on the TRH property with the permit number and name and contact information is available to the public. I recently had need to contact a TRH property manager and ask Sarah County HHS for the contact information. I was not provided the information. I was required to provide my phone number for the company to contact me. The information should have been provided to me. If a sign were posted on the property, I would not have to ask. The county should also include the TRH compliant link to the main page of the county website. It has been buried in the HHS pages and most do not most people do not know it exists. Linda Zomer Edgewood property owner. Thank you. Is there anyone else would like to speak? And your name and address, please. Hi, my name is Mary Stibby. I live on 14941 uh, W uh, Dinah Lake Drive in Hayward. I've been a full-time resident um, in Hayward for the last seven years. Um, unfortunately, we have a short-term rental that went up next to us. Um, I guess my point is uh, this ordinance, I'm in favor of this ordinance. 
Um, I don't think that it satisfies all of the issues that I have seen. Um, however, it's a starting point. And I think uh, it does help as far as um, being able to put some controls over uh, what occurs. Um, as as uh, folks have already talked about, you know, renting a one room cabin with eight people in it, um, hotels don't allow eight people to rent a one room hotel room. So, you know, I think it, we do need some regulations. We have a, uh, the septic system is set up for a two bedroom. Um, we've seen up to 13 people in, in the, uh, the house next door. And the noise problem is a huge issue. Um, it, they may think that they're doing a, a uh, service to be able to provide a family into a home like that, but when you put 13 people, the noise level is incredible. Um, we're on a private lake in a, in a very small residential area, and it's really been quite disruptive. Um, currently, there's no restriction on the number of, of um, uh, people that can stay in that short-term rental. There's no, uh, what we see is that uh, there's no um, contact between the owner and the renters. Um, you, you leave it up to the neighbors to police it as far as if there's issues. So I ask you to vote in um, favor of this. Uh, I, again, I don't think that it's an end point, but I do think it's a starting point as far as being able to uh, support and, and address the issues that are being seen. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Another Anyone hand, else? Another hand went up. Jenna. Yeah, hi, this is Mike Nyland. I'm using my wife's account. Um, I own a short-term rental on 13980 True North Lane. Could you give your name, please? Can you guys hear me okay? I'm off mute. Could you please give your full name? Yep, my name's Mike Nyland. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, yep, I own property at 13980 True North Lane. Um, so I just, I'll agree with a lot of what I've heard from uh, just some other hosts who've spoken tonight, um, you know, about some of the issues with the ordinance um, without repeating a lot of that. I, I do think a, a thorough economic impact assessment um, would be a fantastic idea, some of the data that was shared earlier, I think, you know, is, is worth going over in more detail. Um, you know, and I'm concerned with the, you know, kind of lack of really, uh, you know, coordinated effort around, you know, what are the real problems that we're solving with this ordinance? You know, I think I can recall from some of the initial meetings, just some discussion around septic concerns, you know, impact to water uh, quality in the area, fireworks, you know, um, just a, a wide range of, of issues without, um, again, you know, a, a plan on, on how we're going to track impacts of, of how this ordinance are going to fix those things. Uh, but what I want to focus my comment on is as a part of the host community, you know, I can't speak for everyone else's economic situation, but these um, short term rental investments for us are uh, a long term strategy. You know, we plan on being part of the community for quite a while. Um, sorry, I just have a toddler in the background here. And so we, you know, we want to be part of the the solution. You know, if I think we're, we're pointing out a lot of issues with the ordinance because we want to be part of a, a solution that, you know, looks at some data and comes up with some solutions that are more targeted to, you know, actually impact some of the issues that residents are are concerned about. And I think should be concerned about, again, you know, we don't want to be the, the noisy short-term rental. We don't want to, you know, be the property owner whose house is, is not cared for. I don't think any short-term rental owners, you know, are, are wanting to be that particular person. We want to run good properties and have good guests and be a good part of the community. So um, that's just where I wanted to focus my comment, you know, as part of that community of hosts, you know, we're here to, to help solve these problems um, if we can actually be involved in that solutioning process. And I hope we can be. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? I wasn't going to speak, but I just wanted to name, please. John Stalter, and I have a property on Moose Lake on Mallard Lane, and I have two on Birchwood, one on Lake Chatek and one off Lake Chatek. 
Um, I just want to clarify. It seems like the people who are against us are complaining about parties and stuff. I would welcome anybody to go to our VRBO page, look at the reviews. The majority of our stays are parents with kids. They come up to have a good time. They enjoy the lakes. They can't afford to buy a property up here, but they can afford a three or four day weekend. You know, I just don't feel we've been fairly represented. We weren't represented in the ad hoc committee. You, you had a manager that wasn't able to put up with it for a while. You know, he had, he resigned, but there was no representation from us property owners that participate in short-term rentals. I mean, there are some huge benefits. We, we share our property. A lot of our reviews are thank you for sharing your property. It's We don't look at it as a business. You look at our reviews, I mean, it makes us feel good because people appreciate what we do. I understand there might be some difficulties with neighbors. It's kind of funny because some of my, I've had more complaints from my guests that my neighbors are too loud that live there permanently than, yeah, one was uh, they were up till four in the morning. There was a divorce party next door. I know my neighbor, we get along great. But the complaints I've received personally on our properties the kid was crying. The kid was laughing. The kid was too loud. The only, the worst one I think I've had was a boat was trying to find a place or find our dock. A horn was honked at like midnight, you know, but I've, police have not been called on me, but we haven't been able to see any, I've contacted the sheriff several times as to any reports and they haven't been able to share any reports for us. So I'm just, I'm trying to, I think we're trying to find solutions to problems that I don't know that we have, but I understand. I would just, I would think in fairness, it would have been good to include some of us for our input because I'm not against, you know, like the septic system. Maybe there is, we need to scale it back, but okay. What if we go ahead and put in a 12 person septic? What's going to be next? Cause the original purpose when the ad hoc committee started was to decrease the number of people in short term rentals. And then it was termed that it was going to be a backdoor approach. That's how we're going to control it. So, I mean, do we really have a septic problem or is this just a backdoor approach to control a problem that I don't know that we really have because we have no numbers to go off of. So I would encourage to vote no against this until we get a little bit better something to vote on, I guess. So thank you for your time. Yes, sir. James Widling, 7376 West Moose Lake Road. Um, my wife and I purchased our home seven years ago. Property we bought, had two homes on it. We had no intentions of having a short-term rental, but with everything that was going on, we uh, are not able to sell the other home because of the way the property has been set up in the past. So we would be stuck with an empty home. We have four uh, sons that... Uh, come up and visit occasionally, but they don't come up enough to justify having a five bedroom home. And Matt is my management company. I live on the property with my wife. We have actually cut back on our rentals uh, number. We went from 10 people to eight people because my wife and I didn't like it. You know, there are things that many of us manage ourselves that I'm totally against having my property on a map, county map of a short-term rental. That's going to set us up for potential property theft, vandalism. I have a good relationship with, with all my neighbors, right? and I have not had any complaints from any of them. I live next to the, the forest. They're not allowed to shoot fireworks. It states it right there. If fireworks are shot off, uh, our township is on top of it. But I'm also on top of it. We also have regulations posted in our, in our cabin that says that fires, you need to check the website. So I am totally against this. You know, it's bear season trash is going to get knocked over, you know? And I think everyone is trying to manage it. And there are bad apples out there that don't take care of it. 
but you're asking us to do some things that I don't think is right. The inspection anytime. We already, Matt already sets up an inspector. We have a once a year inspection. We have our septic system checked three times, uh, once every three years. And if there's issues, we get written up and we have to comply with it. Those things are already being done. You know, so I would really encourage you to reevaluate this. You know, there are a lot other issues out there in this county. I grew up in Wisconsin Dells, the largest uh, tourist area in the state of Wisconsin. And there's no way they would do something like this. I lived on Lake Delton. Almost every residential home now is VRBO on that lake alone. You know, so we really need, you know, Sawyer County does a really good job of attracting people. And this would really deter. I only have two rentals this year. People are already feeling the pinch. They can't afford to come. And you're going to put restrictions on us? More? I'd really encourage you to reevaluate what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Another online. State your name and address, please. Hi, uh, my name is Nancy Rose. Our property is at 10864 uh, Linden Road in Hayward. Um, and we, we have uh, uh, owned the property for uh, 30 years now. And uh, my mother had it first and she just had it as her own property, although she doesn't live there. She, she went there um, only occasionally. And uh, uh, we're hoping to hold on to this property. And um, if, if when when my mother was leaving the cabin um, and only coming occasionally, we had um, crime problems, uh, and the place wasn't as well taken care of. And um, I feel like uh, the value. Uh, of our property and uh, subsequently the neighbor's property is less if uh, we're not there all the time. And uh, uh, we have a property management company that is really responsible. You know, I know that uh, our renters, uh, our families, uh, I, I know that they're quiet and they follow the rules and uh, we try the best we can to comply with uh, all the rules and we're conscientious about noise and we keep our, our, our property really safe and nice. Um, and uh, I feel like we're part of the Hayward economy. And when you go to, Hay go to the town of Hayward, uh, just about everybody you encounter is a short-term renter and they're uh, spending money at your restaurants and they're, and they're um, buying things at the stores and um, taking part in uh, 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 rentals from the marina. And I think that if, if you restrict um, these, these um, property rentals too severely, and I think that um, just sticking to the two-person per room uh, occupancy, that's, that's a, a little a little unreasonable. Um, I think you're gonna you're gonna take a hit on your economy. And I heard somebody else talking about the the tax revenue that's going to be lost. Um, and uh, I feel like you know the end result might be that only millionaires uh, can live on the lakes in Hayward. Uh, and I, I'm not sure that we would like that uh, that um, end result either. So I am not in favor of this ordinance. I'm, I am in favor of enforcing and making the situation better because I know that there are, it sounds like there are bad apples that are making it so none of us can have nice things. Um, uh, but I think that maybe we need to go back to the drawing board. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else?
Yeah, hi. Can can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name's Rick Diamond, and I have a property at one two four eight two North Hard Rock on Nelson Lake. And I would I would agree with my my fellow short term renters. Um, my wife and I bought this property three years ago, and we have a young family, and we bought it with the idea of in the next five to ten years on our own. We're chasing kids around in the cities right now, so we do a short-term rental. Um, we, we are diligent in vetting our renters, making sure that they're not big drinkers. We have great relationships with, with our neighbors to tell us if there is a problem. Um, we, we look for the people that are respectful when they come to our place because we, we really do consider it a place we want to retire to, hopefully. And I guess I, I'm, you know, Number one, when, when people come to Hayward, they don't they don't want to stay downtown Hayward. They want to stay on the lakes. They want to do the bonfires and tubing and, and fishing. Um, and that's what short-term rentals have, have given these people the opportunity to do, in, including ourselves in, in past vacations. I, my, my biggest concern is the occupancy. My wife and I have a book of business now of families that started you know three years ago that would have fallen into the two people per bedroom, but now I've had infants, one-year-olds, two-year-olds. Um, I guess I question, you know, are, are we going to hold uh, an infant accountable as, as an occupant uh, to a bedroom? And now I have to turn away people that have been coming to my to our spot for, for three years to enjoy the place that are respectful. Um, don't bug the neighbors. I, I, have, I have a great relationship with, with my neighbors, and they know to call me at, at any time, and I'll take care of the problem. Um, we have over 50 reviews, like the other gentleman was saying, uh, I mean, you're welcome to check our place uh, of people just, you know, so grateful that we share our place with them. Um, I guess I just want on the record that I, I'm definitely not in favor of this. And I, I think it's going to have a huge economic impact to the city. Um, and you're going to lose short term rentals and people coming to Hayward. Thank you, Rick. Anyone else? I have a motion to come. I'll, to I'll make that motion and we come out of public hearing. Thank you. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to come out of public hearing. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your comments. Um, number eight, consider approval of the minutes from our previous meeting. The motion. I'll second it. Motion's been made and second to approve the minutes from our previous meeting. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So carried. Number nine, public health. May we have a public health report from <clears throat> Julie via Julia? <laughs> um, the report is included in um, your packet of materials. Um, we did close the community health assessment, so we're still working on pulling out that data together. Um, and I think that's about it for additional pieces. Any questions on public health report that was in here? Okay. All right. Number nine B, consideration and possible action on the tourist rooming house ordinance. Committee? Any comments? Well, I guess I'll ask uh, Julie as our public health official, um, what are your thoughts on this ordinance? Do you feel that it was vetted as best we could and as can it be amended as we work through this? I know if we pass it here, it's going to go on to the full county board for consideration and approval. Is that right, Andy? Yes, if the committee recommends forwarding it on with approval, it will go to the county board for sure. approval. And is our legal counsel on Zoom as well? No, we don't have legal counsel on. Okay. All right. But if you could comment, Julia, okay. for us, I mean. Um, yeah, there are, there are some questions that had and comments that had come up that, um, you know, if the committee would like us to review and bring back, we certainly can look um, at some of that data. Um, met uh, many times trying to figure out how best to move forward um, with an ordinance that we that is enforceable. Um, I think that's kind of the issue. I know that there are concerns about 
you know, those bad apples in there. But unless we have something that we can put across all places, it's hard to do. So um, that was one of the things that was really thought of through the ad hoc committee process. Do you have um, other follow-up? Uh, uh, unfortunately for tonight, uh, Ju both Julie is out of the country as well as Matt. So I don't have those additional answers for you. Um, but if you have additional pieces that we might be able to answer. Yeah. Well, one question that I had that came up a number of times was the occupancy. And you chose your occupancy on this ordinance based on state statute. Is that correct? That's based on yeah, residential, the POUTS residential statute. And should they somebody be on a septic system, then we would go refer back to um, the debt cap housing or the residential help or the housing capacity from what debt cap and that's the licensing or um, statute that we would follow. And we cannot be less restrictive than the state, yep. correct? Can, we can't be more, more. more restrictive. I'm sorry. No, no, you said it right. Yeah, we she can't be right. less restrictive. <laughs> we can't be less restrictive. Are, are other counties in the area doing this? Or are we the only one? In, I don't have a rundown, but they're, you know, during the course of this, we've communicated with a number of counties around the state that are either we've used, reviewed their ordinances or they're in the process of doing revisions. And I think we've kind of discussed too that some are doing it through a zoning process and a zoning permit and a, some are doing conditional use permits. We've chosen to do it through a um, permit through public health, like a piggyback on the state permit that these establishments are already getting. And, and as noted by Ginny, this, you know, we took, this is an ordinance that was in place and then we pulled a bunch back from it basically because it was really restrictive when we started off. My question is, and I'm coming from law enforcement for 26 years, I don't like overreach and mm -hmm. and I'm my my main question is why are we even looking at this if our state laws that we enforce why does as a county as an entity do we need to get involved in this and try and regulate it? well oh you go ahead yeah I mean two things one is and I think there's some fair statements that have been made that there are some bad apples you know there's been issues and I'm not gonna say they're even widespread but through, I mean, there's a state license, but even that, if there's continuous problems that, uh, um, and there's laws to enforce like fireworks and trespassing, things like that, that has no effect on a license. By establishing a county permit, if we have bad managers or, or properties that aren't addressing issues, we have a, a way to tie that to their future licensing to be a tourist rooming house. Um, that's probably the main reason. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing with the occupancy is like Julia said, we didn't pick two person per bedroom. That's based on state code. Um, and that's the option we have at this point, unless the state wants to change the way they're um, administering the, the DAT cap and the uh, DSPS code. I mean, actually, I would probably, and this I think is something we could bring back with a better legal explanation, but it's something that should have been being done originally. And the rooming house industry took off before it was addressed and included as part of the permit process. So we probably have as much, and again, I'm walking out here a little bit, some liability for not applying it up to this point. And Madam Chair, this ordinance can be amended, correct Andy, and, mm -hmm. and revisited in the future if we see any necessity or Correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the committee could bring this up at any time to revise its amendment. If things are not working. Yes. Let's and I, normal. Julie, I sat on that ad hoc committee and there was many members there, correct? And many were tourist rooming house managers. On the owners. board, we, uh, just with public comment mainly, we did not have, we were. Oh, Mr. We, Gale was on we were, the Yes, he, he was and, not there for many of the meetings. But yes, that would have been where yeah. we were hoping to get the uh, the comments. 
Sure. Well, then, Madam Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve the tourist rooming house ordinance and move it on to the full county board at our next meeting. The draft ordinance as pre presented in front of us today. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Can we do a roll call vote? Certainly. Yes. Do we have a second vote? No. We have a second. I'll second that motion. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Uh, Mr. Smith? No. Mr. Haney? No. Mr. Companion? No. no. Ms. Pettit? Ms. Pettit? No. Ms. Wilson? Yes. Mr. Schumann? Yes. Mr. Van Etten? No. Five to two. The motion fails. So committee, um, the motion failed. Um, would you like this to go back to the ad hoc committee for further work based on the comments that were made tonight or it would still go on to the county board with failure here or no? No. 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 So we either fail it or move it on or what do you want to do? I have my yeah, hand up. Oh. Can't see it needs to go back to the ad hoc committee for review. We cannot pass an ordinance onto the the main county board and then try to amend it over and over. This is what happens all the time. And then we end up in a bind. It needs to be, I, I, I agree with Mr. Van Etten with my father being law enforcement for 35 plus years. Um, we cannot continue to police everyone and everything. Um, these people have invested their time and money in these properties. Yes, there is not enough homes for the people that are already here. But if we do not have those tax, do tax dollars, we cease to exist. It will fix our roads. It builds our communities. It builds our community. It needs to go back to ad hoc. It needs to, the occupancy, there is no way that we can be doing two to a, a room. And you're looking at turning away business which affects complete downtown Hayward and all the outlying communities. Thank you, Don. I think that sending it back to the ad hoc committee and getting those numbers that uh, the crowd was saying didn't exist, they might exist. We haven't seen them, I guess. Uh, being in law enforcement around here for eight years, I've never been called to one of these homes for any issues. So I have a hard time believing the numbers, I guess, for, for what we're um, – proposing, I guess, right now. So something that should go back to the ad hoc committee and maybe it will strengthen uh, this decision if we do have those numbers, maybe. Thank you. Okay. We don't need a motion for that. All right, we'll just send it back to the ad hoc need a motion? committee uh, for further review. Okay. Our ad hoc was dissolved based on moving it from zoning to to health and human services. So you guys would have to work that out. Andy? Hey. I'm not. The Wisconsin County Association is working on this right now. I live at Wisconsin County Association to come out with something that said be statewide because if you have something now, I've been in this three times on the ad hoc committees, and I can tell you that we're going to be right back to the same place we were before. Yeah. Thank you, Just Cheryl. So it's not there. There's some of the larger resorts that they have, they're larger systems. They're not a septic tank for every cabin or two cabins like that. It's a larger one that would not be adhering to the same 
right here that because there's a hotel. Yeah, I'm not familiar that the ad hoc committee was dissolved. I mean, they did complete their work and forwarded on to the zoning committee and the health and human services committee with the recommendation that it be a health and human services or a public health uh, ordinance amendment. So, I mean, you could send it. I, I don't see any reason why it couldn't be sent back to the ad hoc committee. Now, you know, that's been a few months, so I'm not sure if the ad hoc committee members are still interested in, in working on it, but we could send it back to them and, Jenny, um, do you know about the ad hoc committee and its uh, yeah. position at this point? I'm familiar with this being dissolved either. It was, um, in fact, you even mentioned in the last meeting that we may have another meeting talking about getting rid of the ad hoc committee. So, I mean, from my perspective, I think that there are still an issue. Yeah, I mean, and then the other option is if you have specific requests, like you mentioned, Mr. Savitsky, we can bring that right back here, or at least bring you more information on the ordinance as it's drafted, and then you can make amendments to it yourself, rather than the ad hoc committee. That's, I mean, that's up to the committee to decide. <laughs> How far along is the state? Should we just wait for the state to come up with something? I, I mean, I, we, do we want to be a trailblazer on this for the- Well, I'll mention two things. One is the WCA has been talking about it. I have not seen a draft or even a committee working on a draft. That doesn't mean that the attorneys that work for WCA aren't working on it. I can follow up with that. The other thing is in relation to, um, make sure I get this right. There is a work group within the department uh, with DADCAP working on a rule revision to ATCP 72, which covers hotels, motels, and tourist swimming houses. Um, that convened about a year ago. They've been working on new language within that. Um, I think based on the last meeting, it looks like they have a couple more meetings of their draft committee. How long it's going to take, though, because once it's out of draft form and then it goes to um, the attorneys for review, it goes to the governor for approval, then it has to go to the joint uh, legislative committee, rulemaking committee for adoption. So, I mean, that's another year. Because, <laughs> well, it could be because the legislature is not going to be in session for the rest of this year until after the elections, most likely, so. But we would we, have draft information. We'd have draft information. I mean, this is just similar to what happened here however many years, five, six years ago. These rulemaking committees can produce a rule revisions and then they just don't ever see the light of day because the legislature or the governor doesn't approve them. But we already were aware of that. We've been monitoring it because it has um, some of the language references in our draft ordinance are part of the rulemaking that they're working on. So there's multiple things happening and timelines. I just, I couldn't give you a, how far away they are. And I could support it going back to the ad hoc committee. Me too. All right, let's, let's have a motion for that, please. I'll make, I'll make that motion for to go back to the ad hoc committee. I'll second it. All right, a motion's been made and seconded to refer this back to the uh, ad hoc committee. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So moved. Okay. Do we need to talk about the renting out of your property guidance booklet at this point? No. Okay. No. Let's move on to the LCO uh, liaison uh, report. Those are my audience, everyone. <laughs> All right. Uh, good after, good evening, everyone. Um, Bill Trapanier, as you may know. Uh, so tonight, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, this campaign I talked about last uh, last month when we were here, I believe. Uh, so uh, LCO has been in, involved with a, a company called uh, Tran Creative. Uh, Ben's in the back right now, and we created the a campaign called uh, Project Falcon. Uh, Falcon, it stands for Fentanyl Awareness at LCO Nation. Um, as you can see, the, the, uh, the boards in the back there, that's kind of uh, something that we have that we're going to take to community events and, 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 and things like that. So I just really wanted to share this with, 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 you, know, with you guys because, you know, these are kind of how we're spending our opioid, uh, uh, our funds that we got. 
uh, where, you know, we want to try to do something more than just, you know, just little signs here and there. This is more comprehensive. We have a, um, there's a manual that, and I think this is the only manual um, that exists of its kind um, for, at least for a tribe anyway. It's very comprehensive. It just, I mean, if you look through it, it goes through pretty much everything you really need to know. Uh, and, it, and it provides resources as well. So these are the kind of things that you can, you know, you, you can get if you look for, um, you know, for the right people that, to help you out. And, and on top of that, with the posters, I think some of you guys have some of the posters in front of you. There's stickers, but, you know, we're providing awareness with the guide, with the booklet, eye-catching the marketing, collateral, uh, um, video testimonials, and we also have websites that, that come along with this. Uh, and then we're also looking at prevention with workshops, discussions, um, surveys, um, and we're using data to provide um, um, groups, especially the youth uh, and schools. And we're really looking forward to strengths in numbers. For, you know, so we're trying to band together, together and really to provide this awareness on, on, you know, on the tribe and even around, you know, even around the tribe. So, and I, and I hope this really has a positive effect on the community, and maybe um, maybe it'll catch on. So. If anyone has any questions, I, I'd, I'd be willing to answer anything. And uh, Ben's here too, so you know he can answer anything. So thank you. I'd like to. Um, where are you going to have this uh, display? So this display will be taken to any um, community events we have, but um, for now we're going to put it up in our tribal office, and it's kind of going to just be there, so tribal members can come in and see it and kind of be okay. What is this? Ask questions, and then we can explain it to them. You know, we can give them um, our, you know, this manual, which is very comprehensive, as is stated. So, uh, but then, like, if we're going to go to, like, events and, and things like that, we'll take them with us. They're very portable. Obviously, we took them here tonight. So, they would take about 10 minutes to set up. Are you going to have um, road signs as well? Um, we're, we're talking about billboards. Yes. Yes. That's, and, and it'll probably, I mean, it, the graphics won't be exactly the same as, like, some of the posters we have, but they'll be similar to this. And we you know, so we got a lot of options on how we how we can go with this. And as far as um, you know, we have stickers, but we're talking about uh, different things like T-shirts, hoodies, cups, just things to you know to spread around and, and have people talking about this. I've gone um, with Joyce Knowlton to other to various schools for presentation on the fentanyl crisis that we have, and she's been very informative with. Uh, four or five people that have come law enforcement and, and public health. And um, are you going to be doing presentations within the school? Absolutely. That's one of our, um, that's one of our goals. Um, we also have an anti-bullying campaign. So this is just our fentanyl campaign. We got like three different camps. We got anti-vaping, anti-bullying and anti uh, fentanyl. So we have three things kind of happening simultaneously. We just wanted to show this because I know this is what I mentioned in the last meeting. So um, absolutely in schools. I mean, in any school, I mean, obviously LCL school, but uh, you know, we can share it with whoever. And the community as well. Absolutely. Excellent. It's mm -hmm. beautiful. Yeah. Very nice work, right? Yeah. It is beautiful. Yeah, I'm proud of it. And, you know, got to give the credit to Ben's team. Yes. And, uh, Absolutely at um, Honor the Earth. I uh, haven't thought about Muskie Fest yet, but that's a great idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. County Fair is a great idea as well. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Ben, do you wish to say anything or are you confident in what Bill is stating there? <laughs> He's just a genius behind the curtains, guys. So. I was just wondering if you were working in conjunction with Forever Joy to make sure that people that have been hit hard by fentanyl locally, it's not just a, I mean, it, it's impactful, but if you could work in conjunction with the groups that are already doing it, I'd just applaud that effort. Certainly. Um, we actually are having a meeting with the coalition tomorrow. Um, the coalition that we, that's between Sawyer County. <laughs> we'll, we'll be there tomorrow. So, Perfect. yep. Be able to share that. There is a hand up. It, it looks like Kim. Yes. Yep. My name. My name is Kim Dale. Um, I actually. Hi, hi. How are you? Um, so I. I um. So I am the the founder of Forever Joy. 
Um, I lost my daughter here in 2019. If you are aware, I've been working with Sawyer County Public Health, um, bringing awareness to, to the fentanyl issue we have in our county. Um, put a lot of time and effort into it. I personally have have shared my story with with school districts throughout our county. Um, here are community schools. I have been in Winter. I've been in Mellon. I've been up in Ashland. Um, so I, I have been doing the presentation with Joyce Nolton with Sawyer County Public Health, um, along with Jess, public, um, you know, the public health nurse. I've also been working with law enforcement. So local law enforcement. Um, I have done presentations at the casino, the last one we had. I am a part of the coalition. Um, my goal, of course, is to raise as much awareness as I can. I, I have worked with putting the billboards up. And yes, my signs are out there with Forever Joy, with my daughter's picture on it, trying to make a huge impact on our community and bring this awareness. Um, I am actually think I have done done my job that I feel I, I have, have wanted to do, but it has not stopped. Um, I unfortunately, I, I do have the, you know, the support of the LCO police department. Um, I, I did have, have them speak with me at the casino with the coalition. Um, I'm not sure, I, I have been wanting to embrace our entire community. I've had a little pushback from the LCO community. Um, and I'm not sure why we are not joining forces to do this together. I, I don't understand. Um, I have tried and I'm continuing to try. So I, I guess my question is what is, um, you know, with speaking to the schools, the only school I was not asked to speak in was LCO. Um, so my question to you is, um, you know, Bill, I guess, what, what are you, um, trying to do that I haven't done, or why can't we join forces in this as well? I guess my question is why you're bringing this, what your intentions are, I guess. I have spoke at most of the schools and I did ask for our community support. Sure, sure. Well, um, I think my intentions are, um, are noble as yours are absolutely are, uh, Kim, and I'm sorry to, you know, to, to, to hear everything and I am aware of that. Uh, you know, I think that more can be done. Always more can be done. And uh, that's what that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, there needs to be more people to, to do things like this. And, and I'm in a position to do it. So um, I'm going to do all I can to provide this uh, awareness. And I'll be more than happy to work with you and talk to you or however, would, however you'd like to do that. And I will be at the coalition tomorrow. So if you want to talk to me, I'll be there. No, nope, absolutely. So uh, again, I just, I want to, um, you know, we don't, we should all, like I said, as a community join forces, we don't need two separate, you know, doing, and I am all for awareness. That's what I need. We need to bring awareness to this because it's killing our children. It's killing our, our, our families. It's affecting all of us here. So, um, you know, kudos to you. I, I think it's great bringing that awareness. I just, I, I feel that, you know, your reference to the little signs being on the... Oh, on I, the, I, oh I didn't okay, mean it like that. So, I apologize. I, that's not what uh, I meant. So Okay, okay. You misunderstood. I, 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 no, I, I understand that. But I, I have had the support of our community and our public health. And so, um, you know, if there's anything I can do to continue that, and I will continue my fight for that because, um, you know, I lost a daughter here in Sawyer County. I, I grew up on Frommel Road. I grew up in an area where, where it's highly affected right now. Um, and my daughter died not too far from where I live. Okay, so so yes, bringing that awareness is highly important. And, and I support all of that. Um, I just, I'm not for competition. I don't need competition. Um, but if we can do this together, that's all I want to do in our community. Thank Absolutely. you, Kim. I think it'll be a really interesting uh, uh, joining of forces to help with this uh, tragic. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and there's no there's no competition here. We're all on the same yeah. side. We're, okay. all, we're all working together, all right? Great. Thank you. Yep. Anything yep. else on your report for LCO? <laughs> all right. And actually, I, I'm going to have to leave after this. So thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thank you very much yep. for this.
Uh, uh, Senior Resource Center. Very brief. Um, we did have a cook hired at the Stone Lake Center, and that cook has since not been able to start, so we are once again looking for another one. <laughs> so we are still looking for personnel. Okay. Administration. Okay, um, I will keep it brief tonight. I just have uh, one update I'm going to give. We have hired a deputy director um, and um, she is on the line right now, Carrie Mann. I don't know if she can take her, put her video on or not so that we can see her, but she will be able to partake in future meetings. Um, one of the things that she'll be working on really is um, kind of our services line and business development. How do we get funding to do the things we need to do for the county, That those types of things. Um, and um, we'll be writing more of a fiscal report along with all the numbers to kind of help you interpret everything that we see happening. So this position replaced um, Patty's position, which was the fiscal manager. Mm -hmm. We just gave this a little bit more expanse to go across all of the service lines. Excellent. Well, welcome, Carrie. Carrie. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then that's, that's all I have for an admin update for tonight. Okay. And 11C, Citation Authority Resolution. Andy? Yep. This has been something that's been talked about for a little while, probably for the last couple of years. Um, by state statute, the county health officer has the ability to issue citations to enforce uh, public health ordinances. We did not have anything in our county ordinance for the county, um, their state statutes that the public health officer enforces, and they can use a, issue a citation. We also have county public health ordinances, but we did not have anything in our uh, ordinances under the, in the second exhibit there, shows the amendments to the county ordinances. It adds number 10, Sawyer County Health and Sanitation Ordinance to the ordinances, which citations may be issued for. And under section 124, the authorized persons to issue citations, it adds number four, the county health officer or any of them employee of the county health and human services department design, designated, or, yeah, that should be. Oh, that should be designated. Designated. Yes, not, yeah, not By designed. the county health yep. officer. Um, it adds those two underlying sections to the county ordinances so that it cleans that up and that they can enforce county health uh, ordinances um, and issue citations for violations. Well, since we don't have an ordinance. We do have an ordinance. We have ordinances. We have the, the ordinance is already there. The county health and sanitation ordinance is chapter 14 of our ordinances. Yes. It, it was not listed under the ones that, that the county, um, um, that citations can be um, issued for. Thank you. I was thinking of the short-term rental. No, that's not, <laughs> yeah. that's totally separate. Yeah. Okay. Um, so could say if, we... if the short-term rental ordinance were to be adopted, it'd be part of chapter 14, Okay. but it's not there now. Do we need a motion to accept the resolution? Yes, you would have a motion to um, recommend approval. That's part of the or uh, part of the resolution and send it to the county board to amend the ordinances. All right. Yep, and I'll make that motion, Madam Chairman. And second from Jeff. We've had a little motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? So carried. Adult long-term care. Okay. Well, I guess I am on. Okay, for, and I don't think that we have Carol on. No. Um, for adult long-term care, um, just has been even increasing in business with referrals that have been coming in. Um, we are retraining, I, I mentioned this last month, um, kind of in a retransitioning training model with some employees. So um, should be fully staffed up here, hopefully in another month and a half, um, so that we'll be able to have two people being able to do all of the aspects of um, going out and, and doing the functional screens and figuring out what people are eligible for. So um, those pieces are there. 
Otherwise, I, I, everything else is pretty clear in the report. And um, if you look through, there's lots of upcoming events and different things that they have going on in the community. Any questions on the report? Okay. Um, with behavioral health, um, and we don't have Alicia on, right? Or Joe? Okay. Um, with behavioral health, we um, are working on kind of reorganizing some of the areas and looking at um, some linkage and follow-up after crisis and how we can best utilize um, that programming in conjunction with Northland Counseling to make sure that people have continued follow-up after a crisis event to hopefully prevent that crisis from reoccurring. So um, one, of the, one of the avenues that we're looking down um, one of the other things in the report that I wanted to make note of is you will notice that Winnebago in the mental health month monthly expense report, um, we're showing negatives in there. Um, it's not that we haven't had anybody at Winnebago. We've been receiving payments from 22 and 23 where they have billed out for insurances and those payments are just coming back in. And so those come in to us. Um, so looking at that report, um, I met with Tanya and Carrie today. I think we're gonna come up with a little better way to be able to show you really what, we, what we've been spending on Winnebago for expenses um, versus what we've been having for revenue coming in from previous expenses that we've had there. Hopefully that made Are sense. Are you telling me that insurance takes two years? Well, some things do, some things get argued out. Um, <laughs> it's been, it, it, it is amazing how long some things take to follow through. So these are pretty big dollars that need to get paid out that Winnebago is an expensive place. Um, so a lot of times things get denied and need to be reprocessed through. So we don't do any of that processing that happens directly from Winnebago and then they pay us back what, what we're seeing there. Julia, is Winnebago a state run facility? Yes, it is. And Andy, didn't we do a resolution to the WCA a year or two ago? Has that gained any traction or anything? Or it is not. not. It is not. What no. was the resolution? The resolution was for basically for the state to cover the cost if we have to put. Oh, if we have to put this. One of the things that they are looking at is because it is, um, there is some things from the federal government where we can't have payouts for certain things because they have, it's more than 16 beds. It's kind of a really weird thing. Um, but federally, you can ask for a change in that from a state. You can ask for the change that would allow us to have um, different things paid for through medical assistance. And um, that is supposed to be going through to the federal government for us to try to do that. So at least we can pull funding through. Um, it's not helping us out as a state in general, but some of our counties like us really get hit with some of these big dollars um, with some of these stays. And we don't have places close to us where we can send people to. We, a lot of times we are stuck with Winnebago. Um, and with Sacred Heart closing, that doesn't help any help us any further. So um, hopefully we'll see some more things. Um, I know that um, our the Association for Human Services that we're involved in is also bringing um, definitely mental health costs forward to the legislature and in the budget. Um, at the next meeting or two, I can kind of cover what the focus is going to be um, as we work through um, working with the legislature on some of these things. That's it on that report, unless there's any questions. Shall we move on to mental health? Um, I just covered the mental health report. Oh. Yep. Our so, behavioral health, mental health. services. Okay, um, Sarah has joined us. Um, you have your CPS um, report as well as your youth justice report um, and your um, expenses report. Sarah, did you want to cover a few key, key things in there for us? Sure. Um, I will try to keep it brief tonight, but I definitely have some updates to go over. So in CPS, I feel like we're doing really good work and we're helping children get to the point of permanency. Um, it has been quite the task, but we are, we are making improvements there. 
Um, for our initial assessment, this is the worker that goes out once we receive a CPS report. Um, she will then go out if it gets screened in and um, basically do an investigation. She has 60 days to do that investigation. Um, and because we've been getting kind of hit on both sides of CPS and youth justice, she has really been at capacity. So we have been reaching out to Washburn County for assistance in this area, and that has been working pretty well for us. Um, moving over to youth justice, um, we have Shannon and Kim are our full-time youth justice workers. They are at capacity caseload wise. I think our workers could effectively manage um, juvenile caseloads at about 12 to 14 per worker. Uh, we also have, we hired a new position uh, for foster care and kinship um, work, and that is Amy Thompson. And we currently, this report says she has five ongoing, but she actually has six. We added one more to hers as she's just kind of helping out with that. She was previously our intern, and she in turn kind of working with the youth justice department. So she does have some experience there, and we are giving her more of the informal type of cases rather than our court cases. Um, last night, we did receive our second juvenile referral that was a gun-related char charge. That juvenile was taken into custody last night. Um, I feel the thing that I feel most positive about working with youth justice is we were working really hard to begin to partner more with the tribe. And um, I feel like we're making some really positive steps in doing so. We are going to be having meetings with them to work with their grant writer to see how she can assist us in um, writing some grants to hopefully get a diversion program started. We, I think a diversion program would be exactly what our county needs to start to turn this generational cycle that has gone on for decades. I think we need to really start to work with kids at a younger age, I'm saying like 10 years old, um, and start to work with them on their truancy. I think truancy is a huge, huge problem in Sawyer County that we really need to start to get, to get a handle on. Um, we, that program would also do cover vaping, alcohol, THC referrals, and just helping with basic life skills. Um, we would also start to implement what we would call sober parties. Um, and we would like to see the parties happen at least four times a year. So we're working on getting the funding together for this, but I'm, I'm super hopeful that this could be the start of Sawyer County starting to get ahead of the game and make changes earlier and avoid having kids or at least as many kids referred to the criminal justice system. Thank you. Oh, yes. Maybe just I want to yeah. drop on and uh, with what Julia and Sarah said. Um, so just to maybe put a little bit of a highlight on this. We've had some meetings with them. This is really, um, you know, we've had some good success here the last couple of years with our mental health, behavioral health for adults, avoiding some costs that have been plagued the county in the past. Um, we're trending in the wrong direction in the, the youth juvenile area. So if you look uh, in the report and you see Lincoln Hills, Mendota, those are not things we've had uh, in recent history. Having youth placed out of county or in residential facilities, those are expensive, those are costly. Um, and so we're looking for, um, you know, solutions. And Sarah talked a little bit about the, the diversion uh, opportunities that we're going to have to look at for youth, just like we do for adults. We are trying to figure out a way to provide some relief to our staff because they are managing some high caseloads. We hope this is a hump, like this isn't ongoing, that once we get over the hump, so to speak, we, we can get back to uh, kind of business as usual. And I should say it's not just in human services. The DA has expressed uh, some concern the last, or starting earlier this year, 
because they're getting some of these juvenile cases from human services being referred into their office. And, um, and I don't, you know, probably differing opinions. Um, that wasn't an issue before. And I'm not going to say it wasn't being done and it should have been done, but, you know, it's probably a mix of some uh, new activity in the county and uh, having some youth justice workers that are trying to, trying to stay on top of it and make some change. So there are more cases being referred to the DA and they are taking in more youth and things like last night, uh, youth involved with the gun are, are, are going to get addressed, but it's going to be a pain point for us for the, the short term, hopefully. And I think the other thing they've told me is that once they take in a juvenile case, it's not, you know, we take it, we address it, and in three months it's off our books. These are usually year-long engagements to get the youth through the, through the system and whatever uh, rehabilitation or support that they need. So they you know, just want to highlight that because that is something we're engaging with them on and will be part of our consideration as we move forward with, with our budget for the rest of the year. Any further comments or questions? Let's move on to economic support. We have Shauna here. She can give some highlights of her area. Same pretty status quo. Um, we are finishing up with the unwinding, the COVID unwinding period. Um, so um, one of the things that I have planned for our staff, something kind of fun, is we will be having um, a breakfast meeting over at the Lakewood Cafe at the end of the month to, to celebrate their efforts in the unwinding. Um, the changes that occurred um, to policy to support Medicaid and food share during the pandemic um, took a lot on, on their um, efforts. And then with the unwinding, I think I've talked with you all before about the increase in calls. Um, those are still high. Um, so the report that I have is just an update from April. The first part of it goes over Sawyer County. We had 1,125 food share cases, 1,956 food share recipients, which equals um, close to $280,000 in food share benefits. Badger care cases, now those cases are starting to um, go down now that we are doing renewals again, um, where people during that pandemic period did not lose their health care. So now when they're coming up for review, we are looking at their household circumstances, collecting that income verification, and we are finding that adults that were eligible during the pandemic period are now coming off of badger care. So those, um, not necessarily cases, but recipients are being reduced. And so you may be hearing um, that in the community that people are losing their health care. That is a true statement. Um, children have a, a higher thrush, so most children in our area are covered under the badger care program, but adults um, a lot of times do not qualify. Elderly, blind, and disabled cases, 543 in Sawyer County, and then long-term care cases, 185. The Northern Income Maintenance Consortium, so our call center, we answered 8,264 calls in the month of April, and that was a 96% answer rate. Um, we processed 1,174 applications, 937 um, renewals were processed, or excuse me, 3,613 renewals were processed for health care, and then the food share six-month reports, those can be completed um, via access, they can upload those, they can call in and do it by telephone, they can do it in person or mail in their form, um, and we processed 808 of those reports. One of the things coming up starting in August, the uh, MAP program, which is a Medicaid program for those who are elderly, blind, and disabled, that um, are not receiving Medicare. So don't know how familiar you are with the disability system, but you know, it takes quite a while to be determined disabled. 
you know, for social security benefits. For Medicare, that can be longer. So you may actually be receiving your social security disability payment, but depending on when that disability determination was made, you may find yourself without Medicare. It's never made any sense to me personally. I think that that's a area of the population that we're determining you disabled. They probably need health care. Um, luckily, our state has the Medicaid um, program called MAP that has a pretty good income level, and we're able to kind of capture those individuals. Um, during the pandemic period, there was no work requirement, and by work, um, we accept in-kind work. So um, members were receiving that without having to do in-kind, and they were receiving the program without having to pay premiums. As of August 1st, premiums will be instated again. So that's another big change for this uh, department, big change for the community. Um, if you're over 100% of the federal poverty level, which is pretty low, you will have at least a $25 monthly premium, but it's Medicaid, so it is all encompassing full coverage. Um, but that is coming up here soon. Um, and like I said, I just, I can't thank my staff enough for all that they have done through this, especially the pandemic period and then this unwinding. So I'm happy to be able to celebrate with them. Thank you. Thank you, Shana. Thank you. Well, we're down to fiscal. We're down to fiscal. Um, I think we really identified the areas that we're concerned about within the budget, really looking at what's happening with uh, travel expenses um, when we need to um, have secure transfer and um, trying to identify more cost-effective ways um, will be something that we're looking at. And, um, and then also really just keeping an eye on those out-of-home care expenses. Um, we can't change that, but we need to know where we're at and we need to consider that as we go into the next budget period. And um, like I said, next month, we, uh, I'll work with Carrie and we'll, we'll put together more of our written um, report to go along with the numbers to help you be able to identify areas that we're really looking at. Are there areas on this budget that other, those were the- Those two? are the main areas that, that I'm concerned about. Yeah. Okay. Well, that hasn't changed. Nothing's changed. Okay. And purchase services recap? Um, yep, that same with us, um, same with everything there. Um, it's the purchase services where we're looking at the, uh, um, the travel okay. pieces. Um, so everything is looking fairly good. Um, overall, when we wrap it all up, except for those expenses, hopefully because of what's happening with Winnebago and, um, you know, when we look at the overall HHS budget, that we end up still being uh, on target. So we'll take a better look at that and look at those numbers as we go. Um, um, like we've talked about, usually about June, um, July is when we can really get a good idea of what's we're hap happening for the year because enough expenses have been coming in. Okay, well, we're to outside committee updates. Anything? Andy? No, and I don't know how many have heard this from the other committees, but we added this to every committee agenda so that if anybody um, serves on committees outside, and that would be like Senior Resource Center for, for this committee, Senior Resource Center, um, Indian Head, Community Action Agency, um, trying to think of any others, Housing Authority, things that would impact human services and your attending those on behalf of the county, we'd like you to bring back any reports or noteworthy. Um, CJCC. CJCC, uh, so the committee knows what's happening at those. We, we're members of those agencies because they most likely provide services to our residents. So just good to hear so that the rest of you can hear what's going on with those. Okay, I guess I could comment then on CJCC and Justice Point with our MOU with them with the tribe. So we met with Justice Point, um, looked at the MOU and made some 
slight changes to it, so that'll be coming. Okay. So we're getting on track to approve that three-year MOU. Perfect. Thank you. Any future agenda items that anyone would like to um, include? I have one that needs to be on. Um, one of the things that we need to complete under Wisconsin State Statute 46.03, parent three, is that we have um, a public participation planning process when it comes to um, our budgeting time and what we, what activities we have going on. Um, so every year we just need to have a public hearing to be able to get input. Um, we're hoping that we, act, a lot of times we're struggling with getting input, so we'll probably try to get a few other ways to get input in, but um, that would need to happen at our next meeting. For the budget? It's for the, really the, you do it during your budget cycle because it's some of the things that the, the population would like to see us doing. Um, and again, it's part of that statute that we do do that. So basically what we do is we put, we put that section in for a public hearing to be able to hear what people would like um, to have happen. And we'll, we'll put the notice out like we do, um, like we did for this meeting. I, Doubt that we'll have that many respondents coming through on for this, but we're it's part of our due diligence to the community. Okay, so that would be in July. It'll be in July. Got that, Lynn? Okay. Correspondence, reports from conferences and meetings? Anything? Nope, I'm going to continuity of operations planning meeting tomorrow, be, uh, make sure that we have a COOP plan in place for HHS. Excellent. We are adjourned.